Good afternoon everybody. Carl Biker here. Just out on a Sunday afternoon ride. And it's the first time I've been out on a bike in about a month. Maybe even a little bit more than a month. Just had so much work on and then DIY to do at home. I finished that yesterday. Woohoo! And, uh, and then the weather's been awful. I mean, it's not very nice today, to be honest. The roads are greasy and wet and a lot of diesel about. Seems to be the common theme at the moment. Uh, but I had to get out. It's just been so long. Saying to Mrs C yesterday, even if I can just get out for half an hour, I just need my fix. I'm addicted. I need that fix. It's a special type of drug motorbikes. Special type that the longer you're away from them the worse. The worse the withdrawal symptoms seem to become. Maybe there's a cut off point where you give up and go back to a car, I don't know. I haven't found it yet. Anyway, waffling on as usual. Uh, I thought while I'm out I might as well do a video that a few people have been asking for for quite a while. Um, I was actually asked a year after buying this bike, can I do a 12 month review? And obviously that's some time ago now. So it's not going to be a 12 month review, it's going to be somewhat longer than that. But I thought I would, uh, while I'm dodging diesel, I thought I'd give you um, a kind of top to bottom impression of this bike now I've had quite a long time to live with it. And it is quite a long time because in the past I've got rid of bikes pretty quickly and the only bike I've had longer than this one is the Z1000 which I've also been asked to do a 12 month review on but of course that'll never be a 24 month review this is the longest for these two bikes I've ever owned bike because I've kind of found a pair of bikes that I have no particular desire to change so what can I say about this one well as you should know it's a Honda CB500X 2015 model it's actually an A2 bike, which means it can be ridden by people who are under the age of 24 who want to do the test without doing the direct access, or by people who have just decided to do their A2 test. Do you have to be 19, I think? Or is it 17? No, 19, I think. Ah, the rules change every 15 minutes, who knows? I think at 17 you can ride a 125 without L plates if you've done your test car. It seems like no desire for people to do the test at that age but I think at 19 you can then go onto an A2 bike and that just means that either you're buying a bike that's restricted so you might buy like a 600 or something that's been restricted down or a bike that hasn't got that much power in the first place which is this one this one's got round about 46 horsepower because that's about the limit that you're allowed to have on, uh, on an A2 and when I was looking at buying it, and obviously I, I had the aforementioned Z1000, which has got more than three times the power of this bike, and a lot more torque too, people were saying, oh, it won't be quick enough for you. Now I can say that after owning it for probably a year and a half, that really isn't true. Yes, it does not accelerate hard. Not hard at all. But, the key point is that it accelerates hard enough that you can do overtakes safely. That was my concern, would I be able to overtake safely? Especially with Mrs C on the back, because, you know, two up, you want to be able to overtake safely, especially when you've got your loved ones with you. And it's fine. So that bit about not enough power, generally, I would say is a myth. If you want 150 to 200 horsepower, and uh, enough torque that you can rip the tyres off just by twisting the throttle then this is certainly not the bike for you I actually, when I came to change the tyres I tried to do a burnout on the old tyres and it's got so little torque it would not even spin up the rear tyre it would rather burn the clutch out I think than spin up the rear tyre so it's not that type of machine but, as I say, it's plenty so I have no complaints about its power Handling wise, this bike is superb. I would say this bike is easier to ride, as you would probably expect, but easier to maintain a line on and gives you more feedback and more confidence in some ways 
than the Z1000 does. Which is, I would imagine a lot of people say is, is quite a bold statement. A lot of that is probably that the Z1000 has so much power that you're always knowing that get something wrong and it's going to try and spit you off. Whereas this thing, you can roll on and roll off in corners with pretty much no impact whatsoever. That used to be a bike shop and now it's a car shop. How about that then? Any of those of you who watch Adventures with Woody will uh, remember that particular bike shop. I'll say no more. Um, so yeah, it's quite a bold statement saying that this handles better. It probably, I mean, it's, it's not true, it doesn't handle better. But it gives you so much confidence in everything it's doing. The feedback, it's a soft suspension, so it's a really comfortable ride, but it's good enough to give you a decent feedback and to hold the road. And that's probably the reality. I would imagine this on a track versus a Z1000, the Z1000, there's no way you'd be saying this has better handling than the Z1000. Absolutely no way. But on roads in Yorkshire, where, you know, the last time they had proper maintenance, we had wooden wheels on our cars. This just gives you so much more confidence because you hit all the bumps and the potholes and the loose stuff. And it just sucks it up. Whereas the Z1000 will be skipping across the road sideways and bumping around. Um, if you want a good example of the difference in how these things feel, I can't sum it up any better than Tosh did with the two videos where he rode this bike and the Z1000. And I'll put links in the top corner to those two videos now so that you can go and have a look at those. And I'll stop talking about the Kawasaki. Because this is about this bike. Um, so what else is good about it? Lovely and easy to ride. Big wide bars, placed in just the right position for me at least. So that you know, steering wise it just wants to go wherever you think you want it to go. It's, it really is ride by thought this thing. Um, and from the riding experience point of view, mirrors wise, superb mirrors, I can see everything. Comfort, I've already said, it's lovely. Uh, the seat's lovely and soft. The suspension is good enough to feel what's going on underneath here, but not enough to vibrate your teeth out. You can probably tell by the way my helmet is not shaking around, even though this is quite a bumpy road, how nice that is. Uh, instrument wise everything's good it's all there laid out clear in front of you i can see that in the 20,311 miles this bike has done i can see it's averaging 75 to 80 miles to the gallon so it's frugal too it goes down a lot when you've got the boxes and the uh, passenger on but you're still getting more than 60 odd to the gallon on it so if you're using this as a commuter or a touring bike it is superb I did do a mini tour around uh, the UK, well, Wales and England mainly, last year with um, the infamous biker who no longer has a channel and um, Wyvern Biker who unfortunately hasn't been up to London's channel very recently. Um, and this bike did the whole thing wonderfully. Those two chaps were on MT09 Tracers a lot faster than this. but. Um, this bike did that tour brilliantly, and it was superb. Um, in terms of sitting on the bike, if you're really tall, I mean I've not had anybody really tall have a go on my bike and tell me anything, but if you're really tall I guess it could be a problem. The, um, the foot pegs are reasonably low, but not so low that you're dragging them round bends all the time. I've never actually hit a foot peg to the ground, I've been very close because uh, Tosh told me off just after we changed the tyres on this and uh, when the tyres only had 15 miles on them apparently I was nearly dragging pegs but it's just that confidence the thing gives you um, but I've never actually dragged a peg but um, so they're, they're not so low but I don't think they'd be cramped but it's not a tall bike I do have a problem with short legs and I can almost flat foot this bike um, where another bike that I've said I want whoop, diesel, bumming things, both wheels slide in there these trucks that drop this diesel everywhere um, yeah what was I saying, oh yeah the other bike that, that sure remained nameless because I said I wouldn't talk about it again I can flat foot this one, I can't quite 
but certainly it's low enough that it's not a problem. I think it's 820 mil. Uh, every other adventure bike styled bike tends to be a good 15, 20, sometimes even 30 or 40 mil taller. And I can't even touch the ground on them things. I say adventure styled, this you certainly in this configuration wouldn't be using it, particularly as an adventure bike. I don't think you'd have any problem with a little bit of light off-roading. But it's not um, it's not kind of Paris Dakar <laughs> type uh, material. That said, if you uh, if you like that kind of thing, there is a company called Rally Raid who have three levels of upgrade for this bike that turn it into, I'm told, quite a serious off-road and potential adventure machine. You know, starting at knobbly tyres and going up to full suspension replacements. Because by the time you've reached that point, you might as well have bought something more adventure in the first place. But unless you're not tall enough, of course, like me. Uh -huh. uh, what other good things are there about this bike? I think it looks good. It's a nice looking machine. Um, it's priced very well. I mean, you can buy one of these things brand new for about six or seven thousand quid, I think. I mean, the new one is a bit different. They've gone to the kind of 19 inch front wheel and made it yet more adventurous. Um, but it's still not an expensive bike compared to some others. And second hand, these things, they do retain the value quite well. So just keeping an eye on this guy behind me in case he's decided to overtake as well. Uh, they do retain the value quite well, so they're not big depreciators. But they're not massively expensive any either, so getting one a couple of years old can easily be done for three and a half, four thousand pounds. And once you have, it's not actually going to depreciate that quickly because it's kind of lost that initial drop. I mean, this one cost me about four thousand pounds, it had full luggage on it. Uh, and heated grips and a couple of other bits and bobs. Um, talking about the heated grips, another good point is the way they've set out the electrics. Uh, I've not had any electrical problems other than a bulb go. Uh, the, um, the dipped headlight part of the bulb, it's a single, single bulb with dipped and main beam on the one bulb. Um, and I had the, the dipped part go. And it was a pain. If you followed the instructions to change the bulb, which I tried at first, the whole front end of the blooming bike's coming off. But I got fed up of trying that after a while, and luckily I've got slim wrists and little hands, and I managed to change the bulb with just a kind of sprained wrist. But just kidding, you know, it wasn't easy. But the actual electrics on it, um, I don't know why more bikes don't do this, but under the seat you have an accessory connector and also in the um, front cowl there's another accessory connector so connected up heated grips it's plug and play auxiliary lights is plug and play uh, and at the under the seat it's got lots of connectors so basically you've got a live you've got a switched live you've got stuff that links in with your indicators and your brakes so if you want to put additional lights on or things that only come on when the bike's on all that kind of stuff. It's really, really easy to do. And I've got quite a few bits of electricery on this uh, already, so it, uh, it does that quite well. Uh, other things, other things. Running costs, I've already said the bike itself is quite cheap, and fuel it doesn't use a lot of. It's definitely a sipper when it comes to the fuel. Um, parts for the bike are reasonable. I mean, all bike parts tend to be expensive, don't they? But they're reasonable. Keeping an eye on this, it could be slippery down here. Um, I've not re replaced a whole heap of stuff on it yet. I've had tyres on it. PR4s cost me about 180 quid for a pair. I've just bought some Road 5s. They were about 200 quid for the pair. They've not gone on yet. Um, I don't want to with all the water and diesel and wet mud that's around, I don't want to kind of add to my risk with brand new tyres, so I'm waiting for it to clean up a bit first. And also, I'm a Yorkshireman, I want my last few miles out of this set. 
Uh, I've had a new chain kit for it. So chain and sprockets cost me about a hundred pounds, uh, and that was for DID gold chain. And uh, I forget the name of the sprockets, but they were reasonable sprocket brand. They weren't Rensel or anything like that, but they were reasonable ones. Um, what else have I uh, have I done to it, price-wise? Uh, replacement stuff. Uh, new air filter that was about ten quid. Uh, oil filter was about six quid. Doesn't use a lot of oil, so you could do a whole service on this thing for about forty quid. So it's a nice cheap bike to run. You know, it's not far off your one two five commuter really in running costs. And then other things I've done to it. Well, not a lot really. I mean, I didn't really need to. The, the handguards are replaced with different handguards, but the handguards that were on it weren't standard anyway. It doesn't come with any, and they make it nice to take that chill off your knuckles. The um, screen I replaced, and I put this little silly thing on the top of it to try and reduce the buffeting. But aside from that, I've already done a lot. You know, tank pad. That's about it. Talking about the screen, though, that takes me into the bad parts. So you've got to talk about the bad parts on these things as well, haven't you? The screen. The screen that comes on this bike, on the 2015 one particularly, the 2016 changed it slightly, but I don't think it's that much better. But the screen that came on it doesn't really do much. Uh, again, I'll point you back to a previous video where I was trying to do something about the buffeting, and I've not really been hugely successful. Where I ran the bike with this Puig screen, the original screen, and no screen at all. And I think no screen at all actually gives you the best results for the worst looks. And yeah, you've, you've got, it's got to look right, hasn't it? Um, so the screen is probably the thing on this bike that is the worst part about it. It's just not effective. I've been on the CB500X forums a lot, and a lot of people have got the same problem. And some people have managed to fix it with different screens, making their own screens, making add-on bits to the screens. And other people are still in the same position of not getting it very good. So I find that unlike the other nameless bike that um, has no screen, this one, it's not really comfortable to ride it without earplugs. With this screen on and with this little aerofoily thing on, I don't get the buffet enough to be chucking my head about though, so it's comfortable, it's just loud, um, so you know, I could probably do to better the screen, a better helmet might help as well, but for me the problem is solved with earplugs. Um, other things that I found not brilliant about it, um, was well, not a lot really, <laughs> I have to say, not a lot at all, there are a couple of bits around the brick rear brake caliper that don't like the salt but I think that's probably the same on most bikes so quite often I have to get my toothbrush out and take a bit of white fairy goo off you know that um, that that would otherwise corrode the only bits really where I can't spray it with ACF 50 because ACF 50 only brakes I'm, I'm told can be exciting so um, so that's one thing and the other thing is the fairing fasteners I think have much to be desired. So this left fairing here, there's a bolt just near my left thigh and that's a bolt that goes into one of those captive nuts and it's a captive nut that is a, a rubber nut with a metal nut inside it uh, and then when you put the fairing on the rubber bit pops into the uh, little housing for it that's connected to the frame and then the bolt goes through the fairing. The bolts themselves, fantastic, no problem with them at all. Um, no rust or anything like that, no corrosion, yeah, everything's fine from that point of view. The, um, the, the inner bit though, the uh, metal nut inside a rubber washer, you go through those like nobody's business. I don't over tighten these things, I barely tighten them at all. Um, and I don't know if, if water gets into them or salt or something, but the rubber seems to perish really, really quickly. And once it's perished, the inner nut comes out and you just end up with um, with a bolt that when you're trying to put it in just spins 
and then the fairing rattles. So you get through them really quickly and they're not cheap to replace. Uh, I mean they're not expensive, expensive, it's not like you're suddenly going to have to take out a mortgage on the house. But they are about £1.50 each and then if you buy in one and get it delivered, which was my mistake the first time round, you, know, you end up paying five quid to replace a rubber and metal bolt or captive bolt thing. So I've now got a handful of them in the garage from the uh, third time one of them just split on me for no apparent reason. I mean, as, as niggles go, that really is a niggle, isn't it? That is pretty minor. But it's an irritant. But it gives you an example of actually how good this bike is and how few complaints I have about it. Uh, the other problem, the other grumble I would have, and this is the same on many bikes, not all but many, uh, but changing the... doing a service is generally good. Um, one of the places that you have to open up to get the um, coolant out is really annoying. It's on the front of the engine and when you open it, all of the coolant that's left... Because you, you take the main bolt out. I'm slowly down here because I don't actually know where I'm going. I just picked a road because I hadn't been down it before. And it's quite gravelly. Um, I wonder where this goes. Uh, yeah, so the um, the main coolant drain bolt is fine and it wheezes out the coolant and doesn't really get coolant on anything as long as you've taken a couple of bits off the bike first. And there are a couple of bits that are easy to get off. But then there's a second coolant drain that dribbles stuff down the engine. And we all know coolant is not good for um, paintwork and whatnot. So it could have been better designed that to not actually we coolant all of the stuff that's actually then quite hard to clean off so you have to kind of get a hose or a jet wash on it to make sure you've got every last bit otherwise I guess you're coming back a year later and finding bits of paint hanging off um, changing the oil dead simple no problem at all there uh, it doesn't even drip on the exhaust which was lovely um, changing the air filter that one surprised me. I expected it to be under the tank, uh, but actually the air filter on this bike, you pop out the battery, which is really easy to get out and change, and really easy to change the air filter. There's a fiddly screw on it that you can't see, but have to kind of take out by feel, but it's easy enough. Uh, but the irritation is the spark plugs. Just getting to the spark plugs is a real pain. It's tank off as you would expect, and then there's this little tray underneath um, that blocks your access to everything, and you have to get that tray out, and to get the tray out you have to take off the ECU and loads and loads of other cabling and bits and pieces, and lots and lots of fragile clips have to come apart, and wires have to be unplugged, and it really is a pain. Um, so I've had to do that once, and yeah, it was... It's not something I look forward to doing again, and annoyingly it's supposed to be done every 12,000 miles. But I suspect it probably doesn't really matter if you leave it a little bit longer than that. Kirby Grindle alive. Yeah, never been here before. Uh, but these are niggles, and for a lot of people, the service in niggles will make not a jot of difference, because a lot of people will just take it back to Honda, I guess, or to the local garage. Where am I? I have no idea. Hmm. I'll go that way. Um, so really, I can't think of much else to say about it. One niggle that does take a bit of getting used to is where the horn is. Every other bike I've ridden, the horn is below the indicator stalk. Why did Honda have to put it above? Um, the horn isn't very good, it's, it's kind of standard isn't it? Most standard bike horns are a bit rubbish and if I wasn't so lazy this would be better because I have in the garage waiting to be fitted um, a Denali Soundbomb Mimi, Mini which I believe is much much louder. Uh, yeah so that's it really. Just in case you've come here to see a review of these things because you're thinking about buying one and you want to have a look at what one looks like I suppose I should pull over and give you a walk around 
of a CB500X that now is getting on for four years old. I've owned it for not quite half of that. But it's getting on for four years old and as I say it's got 20,324 miles on the clock now. So I'll find somewhere to pull over, I'll have a walk around it and then I'll finish up. Okay then, so this is the bike, let's have a walk around so you can see it, get out of the way of this car. The flying strawberry. I'm okay then. <laughs> Wonder if I'm lost. So the flying strawberry then. See, fairly standard. Got the uh, crash bars on the front and luggage on the back. Standard exhaust, very quiet. Um, and that cable hanging out from under the seat that I need to root better is the cable for the heated vest that I forgot I had on, but luckily it unplugs itself very nicely. But you know, for a, for a four-year-old bike that's done 20,000 miles, she's looking all right. The exhaust looks a bit brown there, but that is mainly dirt. Because, um, well, it's the middle of winter and I use the bike. Um, there is a little bit of corrosion on it, but nothing that won't polish off when it comes to summer. That's the Puig screen. The basic screen only goes to about here. But actually seems to cause more turbulence than it solves for me. People of different heights may not have that problem. There she is. So that's my Honda CB500X flying strawberry. All in all, I think it's a super little bike and I definitely recommend it to anybody who's um, starting out and wanting something a bit bigger than a 125 but maybe isn't wanting to jump straight onto a super bike yet anyway i've waffled on long enough so thank you everyone for watching ride safe and i shall talk to you all again soon i did forget one thing the bike is very very quiet and the gears are very close which in itself isn't a bad thing at all but it does mean that it's hard by hearing alone to know what gear you're in which is why I went with the 10 quid option of a little gear indicator down there but aside from that can't complain